Well, good morning. How's everyone doing? Awesome, awesome. Hey, uh, we are doing baptism here in our service this morning. I love baptisms at Grace Fellowship. I know y'all do too. It's always a great time of celebration. And what we are celebrating is that these people have placed their faith in Jesus. Uh, They believe that God sent his one and only son to uh, die and to be buried and to be raised again so that we can walk a new life. They've already made that faith decision. And then today what they are doing is they are going public with that. And so already made a faith decision. This follows that faith decision. And what they're declaring to the world is a, a public presentation that they've made that decision. They're on God's team. They're part of God's family. And uh, that's what they are showing us today. And that's what we get to celebrate with them. You know, scripture tells us that whenever somebody places their faith in Jesus, it says that the angels have a party in heaven, right? There's a celebration that happens in heaven. And I believe that baptism is our opportunity to have a celebration right here on earth. And that's what baptism does for us as a church. Well, first in the water, are we ready over there, Rocky? Okay. First in the water today is Cooper Byers. Cooper Byers is a student. Yeah. Cooper Byers is a student right here at Grace Fellowship. He is involved in our student ministry. You'll also see him walking around, snapping pictures, doing stuff for social media. He loves to do that and serve here at the church. His dad, Nathan, is baptizing him today. And uh, he said his family and Pastor Corbin helped him make a decision to follow Jesus. And he's doing this to show the world that he's ready to walk with Jesus. Coop, have you placed your faith in Jesus to save you? Yes, sir then it is your dad's privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, ready to walk in a new life. (laughs) All right. Okay, and next is Angel Rivera. Come on, Angel. Let's give it up for Angel Rivera. Angel gave his life to Christ at a young age, but has renewed that here at Grace Fellowship recently. Uh, He says Stacy Harden helped him make that decision. And today what he's doing is he's showing that he is ready to follow his word. He's ready to follow God's word by going public with his baptism. Angel, have you placed your faith in Jesus to save you? Yes. And it's my privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk a new life. (laughs) Okay, and next we have Rory Doherty. Rory, come on up. Rory and her parents are going to participate in this. All right. Feel free to come on up close if you guys want to. Uh, Rory gave her life to Jesus about a year ago uh, at home with mom and dad. And uh, she's doing this because she says, I believe that Jesus died for me. That's pretty simple, right? I'm doing this because Jesus died for me. Rory, have you placed your faith in Jesus to save you? Then it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk a new life. And finally, we have Branson Harless. Branson Harless. Branson is a student here at Grace Fellowship, and he says that he gave his life to Christ at youth camp two years ago. And he says that mom and dad helped him uh, walk through making that decision. And he says he's doing this today to get closer to God. And he said, check this out. He wants to be a pastor one day. Awesome. I feel like he's gunning for our job, Rocky. Hey, I'm, I'm, I might give it to him. Okay, all right. So, so. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Branson, have you placed your faith in Jesus to save you? Yes. Then it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk a new life. All right. Way to go, Branson. Way to go. All right, well, what a great celebration. Let's pray. And then we'll continue to sing. Heavenly Father, thank you for each one of these who have placed their faith in you, who have stepped into an eternal relationship with you, but not something in the future, eternal life that they can step into today. 
And the first step of that is to go public with their faith, uh, declare to the world that they're in a love and eternal relationship with you. And God, we celebrate with them. We thank you for the privilege of being able to do this together as a church today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's get on your feet and let's continue to sing.
Hey, and welcome to Grace Fellowship. My name is Corbin, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff. I want to take a moment and say thank you for choosing to spend some of your weekend with us. There are so many other things you could be doing, and we're thrilled that you're here with us today. Whether you're live at our Paradise campus or watching online, we hope that you find the time you spend with us today both meaningful and encouraging. If you're on campus, I'd like to turn your attention to the QR code on the seat back in front of you. If you're joining us online, you can skip that step and just go straight to gf.church links. Through this link, you can find out more about Grace and our ministries, register for baptism, fill out a serving interest form, and register your kid or student for one of our upcoming summer camps. That's right, all camp signups are live. And make sure you register your intermediate, middle, and high school students now to reserve their spots at camp. Camp is one of the most powerful events we do each year for our kids and students. In fact, it's because of your generosity that we can provide them this opportunity. For those of you who are consistently partnering with us in financial generosity, we want to say thank you for allowing us the opportunity to invest in the next generation with experiences like camp. And for those of you who are considering giving for the first time, we want you to know you're not just investing money into the church, you're investing into the next generation so that they can know and follow Jesus. And this investment not only impacts the next generation, but it can impact your life as well. Don't believe me? I would love for you to hear about the impact of investing in the next generation from Nick and Alicia. My name is Nick Hedgelin. This is my wife, uh, Alicia Hedgelin, and our son, CJ, nine months old. Um, we are from Springtown, Texas, and we've been attending Grace Fellowship for how long? Three, four years? Three years, yeah. yeah. Three years now. How did you, how did you get so, so, we actually got into serving from being in Rocky, uh, Rocky Johnson's... <laughs> life group for young married adults. Uh, this is before we had CJ and he kind of pushed us to serve and you know he, he kept saying hey I think y'all would be good in, in the elementary and I just kept shaking my head like no I don't think so. Um, <laughs> well, I don't think I could do that but you know we met with uh, we met with the, the youth pastor the elementary pastor and We've been doing it for what about two years now? Yeah. You know, when we first started serving, there was maybe 40 or 50 kids uh, in the elementary room, and it's just been growing and growing. Uh, God's been doing amazing things, and we've got so many new kids coming, uh, coming to the uh, the elementary room, and we're running out of space. And, you know, uncharted for me means more room for people that are moving into the area and, and ultimately the kids that are going to come with them. Um, we, we need more space. Yeah, I think the definitely a big part for us is, you know, the opportunity to get to invest and grow as a church and be a part of that growth. Um, I think in our personal relationship to Uncharted has really challenged us to, you know, not go with just the status quo, but to look at what God's asking us to do with our money, with our time, with our relationships, um, and really ask Him, you know, how we should be using all of those resources that He gives us. Um, versus just kind of going and getting caught up in the day to day. We obviously have a nine month old here, so it's very easy to just get caught up in life and so uncharted has been a great chance for us to really just evaluate you know our relationship with god and what we're doing to grow that and invest that not just our money into the church i think the first thing about elementary that's so fun is just how passionate those kids are um seeing them like line up to do the memory verse um want to be a part of that to give us a prayer request each week uh, first time that i walked in the kids ministry you know, it was complete chaos uh, 15 20 minutes before the service started and you know kids start coming up to me wanting to talk to me wanting to get to know me asking if they'll throw the ball you know um but for me, it's just been getting to know these kids. Uh, the same kids that keep coming in every single week, new kids that keep coming in, uh, I get to know them. I get to know what their life's about. 
I get to know their struggles, their triumphs. For me, it's it's the high fives and the atriums and the hugs. You know, these kids learn to learn to trust you and to, to talk to you about stuff. And uh, I I want somebody to do that for CJ eventually. I know I won't be able to to be in the same room as him because I'll be trying to discipline him. Uh, but for somebody for another guy to come in there and invest in CJ's life, uh, that would be something huge for me. If you want to take your next step in investing in the next generation, we would love to help you get plugged into one of our serving teams in our preschool, kids, or student ministries. You can let us know if you're interested by filling out the serving interest form at gf.church links or by using the QR code mentioned a minute ago. Our hope is that every person would consider attending one service each week and also serving one. Now, enough from me. If you'd like to take notes during the message, you can access the digital notes through the Bible app, or you can take notes using the card in the seat back in front of you. Again, we are so glad that you're with us today. We hope and pray that God would speak to you this morning through Pastor Chris's message. Good morning. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Yeah, yeah, yeah me too. Uh, hey, if you don't know what Uncharted is, I would love for you to check it out because it, it is something that God is, is leading us to, into as a church. We did a series about it last uh, fall, and you can check out more about it uh, at gf.church slash Uncharted. We're going to talk more and more about it because we believe that God is leading us into uncharted territory to carry out our mission as a church. And so we're going to make room for those who aren't here yet and we'd love for you to join us in that journey. But today, we're going to wrap up a series that we've been talking about relationships, how to have meaningful relationships. We've called this a playbook, and it's because we want to follow God's design. And today, we're going to specifically talk about God's design for marriage. And the reason we're going to talk about this is because God cares about this. There's there's three to five, depending on who you look at, institutions that God has established, and marriage is one of those. He, he, he established it. He cares about it, and we care about it too. And as a church, we believe God has put it on our heart to help people build unbreakable marriages. So we're going to look at that today. And if you're not married, I get it. You're going, really? But I want you to know, you probably fit into one of four categories, okay? Okay. Maybe you're here today, you're single, and you are ready to mingle. I was going to actually have you raise your hand so you could find each other, but we're not going to do that today. <laughs> but, but here's what I would say. What we talk about today is crucial for you to build a marriage that lasts. It should create framework for how you date and who you date. It's so essential for understanding God's design for marriage. And, and maybe you're here and you're divorced and you go, uh, man, I really don't like talking about it. I want, to know that, I want you to know this. I'm so sorry that you've walked through that. I know that nobody gets married planning to get divorced. It's painful. It, it hurts. And I hope that what we talk about today might help bring some clarity to, to, to uh, what happened and even bring healing as God shows you some truth about, you know, what, what went uh, wrong and, and what happened the way it happened. And maybe today you're here and, and uh, you, you uh, are widowed. 
You, you outlived your spouse, and I know that that's very painful, and that's very tough. And my hope is today, as we talk about God's design for marriage, is that maybe you would even be encouraged and comforted as you're able to reflect on the way that you experienced God's grace in your marriage. And I know that there's some here today that you'd say, man, I'm single, and I have no plan to mingle. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Okay, actually, Jesus himself proved that you can be single and live a pretty significant life, all right? Paul actually said it's better that you don't get married if you can uh, remain single, all right? Uh, why? Because a meaningful life's not built on marriage. But regardless of your marital situation, here's what I know. We all know someone who's married. We all know people who are getting married or one day will get married. And what we talk about today could be the best marriage advice you could give anyone. So even though not everyone's married today, I believe that God has something for everyone today. So let's stop and let's ask God to speak to us today through his word. Holy Spirit, will you speak to us today? Will you open our hearts and, and let your voice be the only voice we hear today? God, will you re remove barriers and, and um, remove blinders so that we can see your truth the way that, that uh, changes our life? God, you're the one who does that, and we ask that you would. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've been married for a little bit over 16 years, so we're experts now. <laughs> Just kidding, not at all. We're still learning, still figuring that out. Um, but um, I've got two boys. I've got a nine-year-old and an 11-year-old, and I love being a dad. One of the things I love being about, uh, about being a dad is I get to teach my boys about the things that I love. And one of the things that I enjoy doing, things that I love, is fire. I like burning things. Turns out they like that too. And so... Uh, that works out. We like to burn things together. But when I was teaching them about fire, I wanted to teach them about, you know, the fire triangle. If you don't know about this, all right, the fire triangle, there's a essential elements for fire. There's heat, oxygen, and fuel, right? And that's what I was taught as a growing up, and that's what I taught them. So we talked about it. These are essential to have fire. And you know what? I was looking this up this week, and I found out that science has now created an argument that apparently there's now a fourth essential, it's chemical reaction, and so it's no longer a triangle. They say it's a tetrahedron, and that just sounds like a square to me, but maybe that's the scientific way of saying square. Yeah, but there's people who, who say it's triangle. Some say tetrahedron. I hear the argument's really heating up, but <laughs> the reality is, is that those, there are essentials for fire, and when you remove those essentials, the fire will not make it. It won't work. The fire will die. It's why when you put water on a fire, you, what water actually does is it displaces oxygen and it, it absorbs the heat and removes essential elements of the fire. And so the fire doesn't make it. And in marriage, there are four essentials to marriage that will keep the flame of marriage going. And I know that many people are very leery about marriage today because the, the divorce rate is around 50%. The success rate is around 50%. But I want us to know and understand that the problem isn't with marriage, it's with the way we approach marriage. We aren't doing marriage the way that God designed it to be done. And for many, it's because we bought into lies about marriage. For some, it's that well, our spouse is supposed to make us happy. There, there's the one out there, the, the myth of the one. And so what happens, you get married, you think you found the one, then you're not happy anymore, and you think you married the wrong one. And the right one is still out there somewhere. And it's a lie, it's a myth that we've bought into. For some, it's this idea that marriage is this 50-50 agreement, this 50-50 arrangement. And there's many other lies, but as a result, the, marriage, the divorce rate is what it is, and fewer people are getting married today than they have in the past. In fact, what people have done instead is they're saying, hey, you know what? We, we should just move in together and make sure we're, we're compatible first. And, and then see if it works out, then maybe we'll get married. But what ends up happening is we move in and, and, and we pretend uh, that we're married. We do marry things. We play house. Then if things don't work out, we practice divorce. So we shouldn't be surprised when, when we get married and things don't work out. We've got a lot of practice with divorce because the only thing that, that not getting married does is it, it makes it easier to get out of the commitment. It doesn't ease the pain of the breakup. You know, statistically speaking, living together before you get married actually increases the rate of divorce. You see, the problem with marriage 
is not the institution of marriage. It's the way in which we approach marriage and the way that we see marriage. And we're missing some elements that God has given us that are essential to building unbreakable marriages. So today I want to look at those four essentials for the next few minutes that, that will help us build unbreakable Marriages. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I want you to know we're going to look at some things from Scripture, but the things that we look at today, uh, that if you apply them to your marriage, you apply them to your life, they're, they're going to help you in marriage. They're going to help make your life better because truth is truth. But here's the thing. As followers of Jesus, we look to Jesus to inform us on how to live out our lives and, and, and truth that we want to live by. And when Jesus was on earth, he talked about marriage. In fact, there's a group of religious leaders who approached him and asked him about the subject of divorce. And he gave us God's desire and his design for marriage in his response. There's a guy named Matthew, one of Jesus' closest followers, who God used to write an eyewitness account of Jesus' life. And he recorded that conversation in Matthew chapter 19. Look at it with me. He says this. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him, trap Jesus with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Now, these Pharisees, their their job as Pharisees was to interpret the law. They knew what Scripture said. They're trying to trap Jesus by getting him to say something to contradict Scripture so they can look and say, oh, see, you're a false teacher. So how does Jesus respond? Look at it with me. He says, haven't you read the Scriptures? He's going... You know what the scriptures say. That's your job. I see what you're doing here. Says Jesus replied, they record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. He, he, is, he is referencing, he is quoting from the creation story back in Genesis. He said that God designed it. And then he goes on. He says, this explains why man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. He said, that's God's design. That's God's desire. And then he says this, since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. So God's desire in marriage from the very beginning was that marriage would be one man, one woman together forever. That the two would become one and by God's design, they would never be undone. But it's not the way it works, is it? Because Jesus says, because it actually goes on in that same conversation. It says the reason it doesn't work is because of our hard hearts. Is that we've rejected God's way. And we say, God, no, we want to do things our own way. And so we've lived out uh, our marriages and our relationships the way we want to, rather than the way God designed, the way God intended them to work. And here's what I know is that most of us would say, man, I want an unbreakable marriage. I want a marriage that is amazing and incredible. And God says, man, that's my desire too. Because here's what we need to understand today is that unbreakable marriages are God's desire. And they are built by following his design. We've got to follow his design. He created it. He made it. And we find his design. Jesus actually quoted from Genesis, uh, the the creation story in Genesis chapter 2. And and in Genesis chapter 2, we see these four essentials for building unbreakable marriages. And we're going to look at it together today for the next few minutes. Now, to give you some context. God has created all of creation. He's created Adam. Adam's named all the animals, and and, and he's there in the garden, has a great relationship with God, walking, talking with God. And God looks down and says, man, it's not good for a man to be alone, but he didn't find a suitable helper for him. So he says, Adam, I'm going to create a suitable helper for you, but it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. And he said, what can I get for a rib? I'm just kidding. That is not part of the creation story. (laughs) That's a terrible dad joke. Anyway. No, no, he said, he said, I didn't see a, a suitable helper for him. So he put Adam to sleep and he took from him a rib and he created a, a helper for him, equal but different. And he woke him up. When Adam woke up, he said, wow, that one's mine. That's now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one's mine. And then God gave them instructions. For unbreakable marriages. He says this, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. The first essential to an unbreakable marriage is found right here of proper priorities. 
that the man and the woman leave their father and mother. You know why you know this is for marriage? It's because Adam and Eve, he's talking to Adam and Eve, and they didn't have a father and mother. They're only two in heaven without a belly button. They'll be easy to find, all right? Here's the thing. This is given. He, he says, listen, this is how this marriage relationship is meant to work, through proper priorities. God first, wife second. Why do I say God first? Because before God even brought Eve to Adam, Adam was fully satisfied in his relationship with God. God's the one who said, I I need to give Adam a helper. Why did he need a helper? He didn't need a completer. He didn't need a fulfiller, a sustainer. He was fully completed in God and through God. He needed a helper. Why? To reflect the glory of God, to reflect the goodness of God and God's love and God's character. See, if we're going to have a meaningful relationship, we've got to get proper priorities. And the first priority is a relationship with God. Because if not, we'll look to our spouse to do what only God can do, and they can never do that. They can never satisfy you and fulfill you the way that God is designed to do that. It's why in week one of this, we talked about, Pastor Rocky talked about loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Because it's only when we begin to experience God's love for ourselves fully that we're able to fully love our spouse. That we learn to see ourselves the way that God sees us so that we can reflect his love and respond in his love to others. Listen, if you aren't married, the best way to prepare for a meaningful marriage, for an unbreakable marriage, is to grow in Christ personally. And only date people who desire to do the same thing. Listen, in college, I took a break from dating for a bit, almost an entire year. Because I knew I needed to refocus my mind and my heart if I was going to honor God in the way I dated. And and during that time, I was having a conversation with one of my buddies. And I said, hey, listen, we kind of decided we we didn't want to just date a, a Christian girl by title. Just a nice Christian girl that we wanted to find someone and wait for someone who would come and and her desire was to be a godly woman. A few few weeks later, I'm driving down the road, um, taking a friend of mine from one side of campus to the other because she'd broken her ankle and she was in a boot. And she was talking about her her girl's Bible study that she was in the night before and how they were sitting around talking about this idea that, man, they don't want to be just Christian girls anymore, that they want to strive to be godly women. And I almost wrecked the truck, all right? (laughs) And a few months later, I started dating that girl. And today I've been married to her for over 16 years. And I tell you that because, listen, yes, praise God. Listen, I tell you that because the thing that has gotten us through the ups and downs of marriage is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Christ is our priority. We want to honor him and follow him. And when we do that well, only then are we able to love each other well. Our priority one is Jesus. Our priority two is our spouse. That's why he said, hey, you need to leave your father and mother. It's a picture of a shifting of priorities. The old family in order to form a new family. He said, leave your parents and form a new family. The the word there is actually a a word to intentionally leave behind. It's almost a picture of neglect. That there's a shifting of priorities from your old family to your new family. Shifting of priorities from your old traditions to build new traditions. Your spouse is meant to be your first priority after your relationship with God. And those relationships should take priority over your kids. Listen, the kids are leaving one day. At least we pray they do, right? (laughs) Right? Listen, kids are leaving one day. Take priority over your hobbies. Take priority over family relationships, social media habits, friendships, personal pursuits, over your self-interest. But to do this, it requires great humility and sacrifice to set aside selfish interests in order to put the interests of your spouse ahead of all other priorities in your life. God first. Your spouse seconds. It's one of the essentials to unbreakable marriage is proper priorities. He goes, let's look at verse 24 again. He says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. This word is joined. 
is, is this, this picture of pursuit. An essential to, to unbreakable marriage is pursuing your spouse, that we would pursue our spouse. That's, that's the second essential, is pursuit. That we pursue our spouse. The, the word is uh, to, to pursue here is actually, Hebrew was like a word picture kind of word language. Like when they said a word, it like created a picture in your head. And so the word actually meant to follow closely behind in order to catch or in order to overcome. And listen, isn't that how you got married in the first place? Right? Like that's how you ended up where you are is by chasing after, after pursuing your spouse. And God's design and desire is that we would pursue our spouse, not up to marriage, but, but throughout marriage as well. It's why I believe that God used Solomon, who's one of the wisest men to ever walk the earth, to say this about marriage in Proverbs 5, verse 18. He said, let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. He's saying, listen, wives, be a blessing to your husband and husbands celebrate and rejoice with your wife. Pursue one another just like you did when you were young. Because we've done some pretty silly things in pursuing our spouse up to the point of marriage, right? Most of us did some pretty dumb, dumb things at some point in our lives to pursue our spouse. Made some mixed tapes, some mixed CDs, right? <laughs> wrote, wrote some poetry that is terrible, right? Whatever it was. Wrote some notes that we hoped our boys never found out about, right? And I know for me, when I was dating Julie, I let Julie convince me to bear, buy a pair of jeans and a shirt that I would have never bought for myself. All right, listen, I was from the country. She was from the city. But she said, hey, you want to go to the mall with me? Did I want to go to the mall? No, but with her, yes. All right, I like Julie. I was willing to go because I like Julie. And we were walking around the mall, and she said, hey, will you let me pick out some clothes for you to try on? And I was like, no, I don't really want to pick out. You. I don't want to try on clothes, but for you, yes, I will. So I went and tried on some clothes. I came out of the dressing room. She was like, oh, I really like those jeans on you. Guess what? I bought the most expensive pair of jeans I've ever bought in my life, and I didn't even like them. Why? Because I was willing to do whatever it took to pursue my wife. And the pursuit doesn't stop at marriage. See, so often we think that the grass seems greener on the other side of the fence when in reality, we just need to water our grass. We need to put some fertilizer on it. We need to take care of the grass that God has given us and pursue our spouse by God's design. It's essential to building an unbreakable marriage. Let's look at verse 24 again. It says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one that this united is a picture of a partnership, an unbreakable partnership. The two would become one. And, and as Jesus said, that the two, when they became one, they would never come undone. The problem with marriage is so often that we aren't following God's design simply in the way that we see marriage. So many of us see marriage as a contract. A contract by design is built on mutual distrust. It's meant to protect my rights and limit my responsibilities, right? If you go rent a, a, an apartment and you sign a lease, you sign a lease that says that I get to stay as long as I pay. Here are the things the landlord's supposed to do. Here are the things that I will do. And if, if either of us don't do our part, then the relationship is over. And that's the way we treat marriage today. But that wasn't God's design. God's design for marriage was a covenant, a covenant that was formed through blood, a covenant that would only be broken through death. It's why at weddings that people say, till death do us part. That was God's idea. It's not some romantic idea. That's God's idea. Till death do us part. See, marriage is a picture of laying down our rights and not limiting our responsibilities saying, I'm all in no matter what. God's desire is that through this covenant commitment, we would build a partnership that was built on selflessness and humility that, that, that it would cause our marriages not just to survive, but to thrive, to be incredible. God used a man named Paul whose life had been drastically changed when, when he uh, began following Jesus, and he used him to write much of the New Testament scriptures that we have today. 
And he wrote a letter to the Ephesians about how to live out our lives, everyday life, and how our faith should have impact that. And he talks about marriage in Ephesians chapter 5. I want you to look what God says through Paul about marriage. He says, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You want to know the secret to, to, to solving a struggling marriage? It's right here. It's mutual submission. Now, here's what's funny. The next three verses... God tells us what it looks like for wives to do this towards the husband. And then it takes the next six verses to tell husbands how to do that towards the wife. It takes twice as many verses to explain it to us, all right? But what's funny is the very next verse is the one that so many men know, whether they know any other scripture or not, and it's that wives submit to your husbands. See, isn't there something in there about wives supposed to submit to me? He's not talking to you. You go three more verses, he'll talk to you. Because what he's actually saying is, wives, wives, defer leadership to your husbands as unto the Lord, as a way of honoring Christ that you would let your husband lead, that you would encourage him, you would build him up, you would cheer him on as he leads. As long as he's not leading you into sin, you would be willing to follow his lead. And then he says, now, husbands, your submission to your wife, what that looks like is dying to self that you would die to yourself the way that Jesus laid down his life for his church to demonstrate his love. He he sacrificed his life to demonstrate love for us. And so he's saying, hey, wives, defer leadership. Husbands, you need to die. (laughs) You need to die to yourself, to your selfishness, to your self-interest. Listen, men, if we have to tell our wives that we are the leader, then we're not leading. When you're leading, you're leading in a way that makes people want to follow. And when you lead like Jesus, I'm telling you, your wives will, would love to follow a leader who loves like Jesus. And then he tells us why this partnership is so important in verse 31. He says, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Isn't it interesting? Even Paul's saying, hey, the original design, it didn't change. It's just the way God designed it over 2,000 years ago. And then he says this. And here's why it's so important. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Here's why it matters so much. Because marriage is supposed to be a human object lesson of God's love for us. A way of putting on display the way that God loves us when we, when in humility and sacrificially, we, we forgive and we love and we encourage and we pursue our spouse and we build them up and that our love would be a story to the world of God's love for them. It's meant to illustrate God's love. Now, fourth essential we see in marriage is in the, Actually, in the next verse, verse 25, look at it with me. It says, now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. And some people are going, now we're getting somewhere. But the fourth essential is not nakedness, all right? The fourth essential to building an unbreakable marriage is purity, all right? Is purity. See, see, they were both naked and felt no shame, meaning they had nothing to hide. They were fully known. And they knew fully without fear of judgment or rejection. That's what intimacy looks like. And ultimately, that's what marriage was designed for and is most fulfilling in marriage when we experience the highest level of intimacy because that's the way God designed it. See, purity, though, paves the way to intimacy. Or earlier in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, I mean, to the Ephesians in um, Uh, to the Christians in Ephesians, um, God says this about how we should live our lives. He says, let there be no sexual immorality. The word there is porneia. It's where we get the word pornography. And if that didn't get through our heads enough, he says, let there be no sexual immorality, no impurity, no sexual sin or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. He says, don't let there be a hint of sexual immorality or impurity in your life. The reason it matters is because it impacts your relationships. Purity paves the way 
to intimacy. And the problem with so many of us is that we draw the long, wrong lines. We say, well, adultery is a sin. So, so how close to adultery can I get without committing that sin? And when Jesus came to the earth, he changed the, the line. He raised the bar. He said, it's not that you should just not commit adultery. It's that you shouldn't have lust in your heart for someone who's not your spouse. Because when you do that, you've committed adultery in your heart. And here's the thing. We will not pursue purity or experience intimacy as long as we're trying to get as close to sin as possible. Don't let there even be a hint. Flee, run from it. Purity is essential to a marriage that lasts because purity leads to intimacy. And ultimately, listen, that's what makes marriage make it. That's what makes marriage incredible because that's the way God designed marriage. And if you aren't married, the way to set yourself up for marriage uh, today, to, for success in marriage today, is to pursue purity now. And if you are dating someone who does not value purity or isn't willing to pursue purity now, it's a red flag because they're not going to value or pursue purity after marriage. Purity is essential for having a meaningful marriage that lasts. God has given us, given us the essentials from the very beginning, uh, his design and his desire for marriage, for building unbreakable marriages, that we'd have proper priorities, that God would be first, our spouse second, that we would pursue our spouse in a way that honors God and honors our spouse and cherishes our spouse, that we, we'd see the partnership as an expression of God's love to the world and that we'd be willing to lay down our lives and our selfishness in order to serve our spouse. That we pursue purity. See, see if we're gonna build unbreakable marriages, those are the essentials. Because unbreakable marriages are God's desire and ours. But if we're gonna experience that, we have to build them by following God's design. Now, let me get real practical as we get ready to wrap up. Some of you, the thing you know you need to do is you need to reorder your priorities. And for many, it, it, it's by starting by following Jesus. Maybe you've said a prayer and you're religious, but you've never had a relationship with Christ. You've never surrendered your life to Christ. You've never fully followed. See, you can be in church a long time. You can say a prayer. Prayer doesn't save you. It's, it's coming to a place where you admit that you sin personally and you surrender your life to Jesus. And if you've never done that, that's the first step. See, we've all sinned. Our sin has broken our relationship with God. And it's the relationship we need for, to, to be fully fulfilled and, and, and feel full and, and have a full and satisfying life that we're looking for. But it starts with that relationship. God has made it possible because even though our sin broke our relationship with God, sin is when we do things our own way instead of God's way. We've all done that. And even though we deserve death and eternal separation from God in a place called hell, God loved us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who walked the earth. He did not sin. And he died to pay the penalty of our sin by dying on a cross publicly in, in a very humiliating way, painful way. They put him in a grave and three days later he rose from the grave so that anyone, no matter how good you think you are or how bad you think you are, anyone who would believe in him could have new life and a new relationship with God when they repent and believe in him. And maybe today that needs to become your priority by starting by putting your faith in Jesus. And maybe you've made that decision, but you've never begun to grow in your relationship with him. You've never chosen to follow him with your life. Listen, we would love to help you with that. If you've never learned how to do that, we have the grow class where we want to give you practical tools on how you can do that on a daily basis. And I want to speak specifically to men. Men, many of your spouses and families need you to lead in this way, that you would lead by example as you seek his kingdom first and his righteousness rather than your kingdom and your comfort. That you be willing to serve and sacrifice and prioritize the needs of your wife above your preferences and your hobbies and your personal desires. And wives, there's some priorities that, that may need to change in your life. Maybe, maybe the kids have taken priority and it's time to, 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 to push them back in proper order. 
Maybe it's the social media habits or your friends or your social interests or friend groups or your extended family. And it's time to reorder the priorities so that you can love your husband the way that God has designed. We need to reorder our priorities and some of us just need to start prioritizing the relationship. That we plan date nights and even weekends away. A couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago, if you didn't see that message, you should go back and re- listen to it. It talks about communication. But, but the homework was is that you would set aside time to have a three to, to, to five day getaway where you just talk and dream and plan, talk about what's important, that you would start prioritizing daily, 30 to 60 minutes face-to-face communication so you can learn to communicate better and that you prioritize daily encouraging and building up and complimenting each, each other somehow, some way. And here's the thing. If you haven't done that yet, it's probably a pretty good picture that our priorities might be out of order. It's time to prioritize the priorities. And you go, well, I just can't afford to do that. I would tell you this. I would challenge you this. There's a chance that some of us are more committed to our subscriptions and our cell phones than we are to our marriage. Maybe it's the fact that we don't have a budget and so we're not able to, to, to fully prioritize what matters. We'd love to help you with that. So that you can prioritize what matters. Because you want to know what priority is in your life? Just look how you spend your time and how you spend your money. That'll tell you what your priorities are. And for many of us, our priorities are out of order and we've got to reorder our priorities. For some, we need to learn to pursue again. Uh, Pastor Craig Rochelle says it this way. It's a real easy way that when you think something nice to say, say it. And when you think of something good to do, do it. That you would be spontaneous and you'd pursue just the way you did before you were married. And for some, it's time to change the way you see your partnership. That you're not saying, well, I'll do this only if... But you say, no, I'll do this because God has already loved me in this way. And my desire is to honor God, regardless of whether they do what they're supposed to do. That I'm gonna just do what God tells me to do. And I'm just telling you, I don't know how, but I believe God will bless that because he honors obedience. He honors faithfulness. And for many, you need to set some personal boundaries in your life so you can pursue purity. When I was in college, I actually got rid of my internet cable in my dorm room and my Friends thought I was ridiculous because that meant I had to go to the computer lab to turn in papers and to, to interact on message boards. But I did it because I wanted to remove the, the, the temptation by removing the opportunity. And many of us, we need to set some ridiculous boundaries for ourselves. They're like, what am I, a teenage boy? Probably, I don't know. But at the end of the day, the reality is, is that we've got to protect our family and be willing to do whatever it takes to do that. Listen, if you knew that somebody was coming to your house to beat up your family and destroy your, your house and destroy y'all, what would you do? You'd have the door locked and you'd have a, a way to fight back. But yet some of us have our door wide open to this thing that is destroying our lives through impurity and immorality and is killing our families. And it's time for us to set some boundaries so that we can fight for our families in the right way. It's destroying families. It's time to pursue purity because your marriage depends on it. If we're going to build unbreakable marriages, there's some essentials. Proper priority, pursuit, partnership, and purity. Because then we can begin to experience the way that God designed marriage. Unbreakable marriages are God's desire, and they are built by following God's design. So what does that look like for you? What do you need to do this week? What do you need to do today so that you can experience marriage the way that God designed? I promise you, you'll never regret obedience, whatever God tells you to do. Today, if you've never put your faith in Jesus to save you, you can do that. That's your first step. When that, until that relationship is right, every other relationship will struggle. All you have to do is admit that you sin, recognize your sin, your need for a savior, believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin, and he did, and he rose from the grave, and he's seen by over 500 eyewitnesses. We have reason to believe, and that you would come to a place where you repent and believe. That means turn from living life your way and say, God, I, I wanna follow you. It's not about perfection. It is a change of direction where you say, I surrender my life to you, God. Change me. Change me from the inside out. And today, if you've never done that, 
As we close, I want to lead you in a prayer as a way of acknowledging that decision today. The prayer doesn't save you. You being honest with God is what does that. So we bow your heads and close your eyes. And today, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, maybe you've been in church a long time, but you've never surrendered. Maybe today's your day of surrender. And you would tell God something like this. God, I know that I've sinned. I believe Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of my sin and that he rose from the grave. And I know I need you. So today I give you my life. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit, that you would change me from the inside out. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. God, my prayer is that those of us who believe in you, that we've experienced your love, that we would put your love on display in the way that we love our spouse. And God, ultimately, that we'd carry out the purpose of marriage to bring you glory that others would know of your love. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Chris, thank you so much. So those uh, essentials that Chris talked about, man, those help us build solid marriages. And if we will practice those things in our marriages, that'll also protect us from the enemy. You know, the enemy wants to infiltrate your marriage. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But if we'll do those things, uh, that keeps the enemy out. So when we build great marriages, we build great families. And when we build great families, we build great communities, right? And so, uh, Chris, thanks for sharing that today. Well, our prayer partners are coming forward right now, and so when we dismiss here in a moment, if you have prayer needs, um, anything you want to talk about or pray about, they will be right down here in the front. So prayer partners, go ahead and come forward, and while they're doing that, I wanted to share with you something really cool coming up at Grace Fellowship Church. Next Sunday night, right here in the auditorium in our building, uh, we are having an abide night. Now, I know we have so many new people at our church, you may have never been to an abide night Let me tell you, you don't want to miss it. This is a night filled with uh, worship, singing, uh, prayer. We'll have communion. And in this particular Abide Night, we are asking God to do something really, really special. We're asking God to show up and demonstrate his power um, to us in our own lives and in our own church right here that night. And so uh, we encourage you to come. These are high-energy nights. They're a lot of fun. Uh, They're very moving. They're a great time uh, to be together and uh, just worship and prayer and pray um, together. So you can come up uh, to the church. We have child care provided. Uh, child care is provided for birth through second grade, okay, birth through second grade. You don't need to register or anything. Just bring them and drop them off. Well, check them in. you got to have that name tag, all right? So check them in, but you don't have to pre-register. And then older kids are welcome to come in here uh, with you if they want, or you can make other arrangements uh, for them. So birth through second grade. Five o'clock, abide right here at Grace Fellowship next Sunday evening. Well, that is it for today. We are so glad that you were here. Come back next week. Bring somebody with you. If you have prayer needs, come on down and talk to our prayer partners.